Psalm 117. Now, this is the very middle of the Bible. Yep. It's also the shortest uh, uh, chapter in the Bible. And um, it's directed to who? Everyone. To the Gentiles. All right. Yes, to everyone, but specifically the Gentiles. Here we go. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. All right, there you go, middle of the Bible. Wonderful, wonderful passage. Next week is uh, Psalm 119, so we're going to skip the prophecy update and the sermon, and we're just going to read the 119th Psalm. Okay, that's not true, um, but it is the longest chapter in the Bible, and uh, 176 verses of wonderful enjoyment. Um, and we're going to skip that and just go on to the next psalm after it. Anyway, um, our sermon today is Exodus 23. It's verses 20 through 33. It's entitled Covenant Promises and Expectations. So Exodus 23, starting in verse 20, says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars." So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among you, all, uh, among all the people to whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out, from be out before you. You shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. From simple logic of what God must be like, we learn that in him there is no change. We don't need the Bible to discern this, but the Bible does bear it out. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, we cannot use that as a principle, which then means that the law which he gave to Israel is eternally binding on us. Some people follow that line of reasoning, but it is flawed. Rather, God has progressively revealed his intentions to the people of the world. When the law was fulfilled in Christ, he annulled it through the new covenant in his blood. And yet there are many precepts which are constant. One of them is that when we are obedient to him in the manner that he has revealed to us, then things will go well. When we aren't, things won't. Some of the precepts in today's verses reflect that very thought. Though the law is set aside in Christ, following some of its precepts will inevitably lead to a good end. This doesn't mean that we are obligated to them, but if we follow through with them, things will naturally go better than if we don't. Further, there is the truth that whatever God has thus far revealed is to be adhered to. At this time, we are living in the dispensation of grace, we are expected to receive Jesus Christ by faith and trust in his works alone for our salvation. When we fail to do this and instead trust our own works, we will not be right with him. And even though we are under grace, we are not given license to sin. Should we ignore the precepts of the New Testament, we will suffer. At all times, God is calling us to continually return to him and to cling to him. Our text first comes from Malachi chapter 3. It's verses 6 through 7. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet, from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, 
in what way shall we return? The way we are to return to the Lord is by following the precepts he lays down for us at any given time in redemptive history. Christ is our Savior, and though we may receive him, we may walk away from him. In so doing, we will only injure ourselves. However, if we remain obedient, our expectation is that many rewards will come upon us when we stand before him. God does not force himself upon us. Instead, he grants us the free will to choose. Adam didn't choose so wisely. Israel didn't choose so wisely. The church is continuously divided because many fail to choose wisely. In our sermon verses today is another chiasm for us to ponder. I needed something to do on my trip to Chicago last week, and I went through these verses with the intent of seeing if there was a chiasm there. And sure enough, there is. The lesson for you, use your time wisely. If you have a few hours, pull out your Bible and study it. Okay, this is uh, Exodus 23, 24 through 33. It's entitled Covenant Promises and Expectations, and I subtitled it Upon Entering the Land of Canaan. All right, A, you see it says, you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do it according to their works. At the bottom, A says, for if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Go to B, you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. Go down to B at the bottom. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. Go to C, so you shall serve the Lord your God. C, you shall make no covenant with them nor their gods. D, uh, this is verses 25 and 26, blessings of prosperity within the land and blessings of boundaries of the land. Then E, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And then E, little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And then we have the anchor verses. F, and I will send the hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the, uh, and the Hittite from before you. And the other one is, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. So you can see the pattern in there. Everything is folding in on that middle point where the Lord is promising to drive them out. Following God's laws has never been hard, but our human nature says, I can do it better my own way. God tells us time and time again that this is not true. He made us and he knows what is best for us. For Israel, at the giving of the law, he told them what was best in order for things to go well. These truths are to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. Our first thought today is, my angel will go before you. It's verses 20 through 26. The words of today's verses close out the initial giving of the law to the people. These words are, they comprise what we would call the book of the covenant. After this, Moses will go down the mountain and present them to Israel. They've already vowed to accept the words of the Lord and to be obedient to them on two separate occasions. The first was in chapter 19. After arriving at Sinai, Moses went up and was given an initial set of words to repeat to Israel. After receiving the word, he came back down, and this was recorded. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. After that, the Ten Commandments were thundered out in the hearing of the people. In their horror and in their dread, they told Moses this, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let, us, let God not speak with us, lest we die. After that, Moses ascended the mountain once again and was given the words of Exodus 20, verse 22 through 23, verse 33. Each of these was carefully laid out, as I showed you last week, in sets of tens, and they harmoniously developed a theme of God's expected standards for his people. These words now close out those decades of verses with the expected promises for adherence to them. The first promise is a great one indeed. Verse 20 says, Behold, I send an angel before you. Hine, anochi sholeach malach lefanecha. Behold, I send angel before your face. It is a wonderful promise to Moses. It is one of comfort and assurance that he will not be alone in leading the people of Israel to where they are to go. It's highly debated who this angel is. Scholars, both Jewish and Christian alike, have debated this and proposed numerous possibilities. Is it Moses? Is it Joshua? 
Is it an angel? Is it the Lord? It certainly isn't Moses because the pronoun is in the singular. The address is to him alone. Many translations capitalize the word to signify their trust that it is, in fact, the Lord. And this is correct. One must let scripture interpret scripture. The pillar of cloud, which was first seen in Exodus 13, verse 21, and which was explicitly mentioned last in Exodus 14, verse 24, has continued to be with Israel. It will continue to be noted later in Exodus 33, in Numbers 14, and as late as Deuteronomy 31, verse 15. In Exodus 33, 3, there will be a time when the Lord tests Moses with these words. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Also, Paul explicitly ties incidents of the wilderness wanderings to the presence of Christ among them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 10, 9, he says that in their conduct, they tempted Christ. Therefore, the angel who is promised to go before them is, in fact, the Lord. The pillar of cloud obscures his glory. Within that veil is Christ, the brightness of of his glory, and the express image of his person. That's from Hebrews 1.3. The promise of the presence of the angel will not be without cost to the people. We will see this in the verses, in the chapters, and in the books which lie ahead. Verse 20 continues, To keep you in the way. Lishmarecha badarek. These words certainly have a triple signification. The first is that Israel will be guided in the proper course to take as they travel towards Canaan. The Lord is directing them according to a set plan, and each stop is where he wants them physically to ensure that they arrive when he wants and where he wants. In this route, they will be safely conducted by him. The second reason is as an instruction for the people. To keep you in the way isn't just speaking of a physical way, but it is also speaking on the lines of morality and obedience. The last time the word way or derek was used was in exactly this manner. Here's what it said in Exodus 18. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. And finally, each stop is recorded as a pictorial lesson for us today. It is to show us Christ. We have seen that numerous times already, and it will continue to be the case with each stop and each thing that occurs at each stop. Christ is being revealed to us. Verse 20 going on, and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. The place he is speaking of is obviously Canaan. The promise was made to the patriarchs that the land would be theirs. Abraham was told this, and it was passed down to each generation since then. Here are the words from Genesis 15. No, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years and also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In those words, we see the reason why the Lord delayed the promise. It was because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. The Lord was patient with the inhabitants of the land. Until their iniquity had reached full measure, he granted them the right to continue in the land. However, the time was drawing near for that to end. Their wickedness was so great that like those before the flood, the only remedy was their destruction. Instead of a flood of water, They would be destroyed by the flood of the Lord's army, Israel. Despite this being the case, these words are given as a picture of the future granting of a place for the redeemed of the Lord, that of heaven. It is what the land of Canaan only pictured. Here are the words from John 14. Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Just as the Lord had prepared Canaan for Israel, the same Lord who came to live among us has given us an even greater promise. We have a home reserved for us eternal in the heavens. Verse 21, beware of him and obey his voice. When taken together with the rest of scripture, in this verse, we have a picture of the Trinity. First, Moses is told to beware of him and obey his voice. This is speaking of the angel who is being sent before them. The author of Hebrews ascribes the words to obey his voice at this time to the Holy Spirit. Here's what it says in Hebrews 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. In Exodus 20, verse 1, the Ten Commandments began with the words, then God spoke. Immediately after that, in verse 2, came the words, I am the Lord your God. In Hebrews, the admonition to obey is said to have been spoken by the Holy Spirit. Thus, so far, both the Father and the Holy Spirit are specifically noted. At the end of this verse, the Son's role will be noted as well. Verse 21 continues, Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. It is the Son to whom judgment has been granted. It is he who pardons, and it is he who finds guilt. All authority is granted to him on earth and in heaven. This is seen even in the Old Testament with the following words. Verse 21 continues, For my name is in him. We are being shown a picture of the Trinity here. As the Lord God or Jehovah Elohim says that his name is in him, then as Adam Clark notes, the Jehovah dwells in him. He is spoken of as a separate person. And yet in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Charles Ellicott notes that God and his name in, are in scripture almost convertible terms. He is never said to set his name in a man. The word translated as in him is bekir bol. It means in his inward parts. In other words, it is united to him. If the essence of the Jehovah dwells in him, then this is speaking of the third member of the Trinity, the divine logos, the word of God, Jesus, the Christ. Therefore, these words return us once again to John chapter 14. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Verse 22, but if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. This is a fascinating verse to consider. In the first clause, there is a change from the third person to the first person. It says, if you obey his voice, it then says, and do all that I speak. This is known as a perichoresis. It's a Greek term which is derived from two separate words, peri, which means around, and chorein, which means in this context to go forward. It is a tenet which is seen throughout scripture but which is often highlighted and magnified by the words of Jesus, especially in the Gospel of John. It gives the idea of indwelling, which then conveys and realizes fellowship between the members of the Godhead. This is seen, for example, in John 15, verse 26, where it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Even in the Old Testament, multiple clues as to the nature of the Godhead are given. This is a beautiful example of one of them. Next, this is a conditional verse. It is based on obedience. In it, there are four individual thoughts containing three repetitions. The first thought, which is also a repetition, is an emphasis in the command. It says, Ki im shamoa tishma bekolo. If listening, you shall listen to his voice. The second thought is based on their listening. It is the application of it. Ve'asita kol asher adaber, and do all that I speak. One can't do unless one first hears and heeds. If one hears, it doesn't mean that they will heed. But if they do, then they will apply what they heard and turn it into action. This then is the obedience of the law. If these two conditions are met, then there will be rewards both of which are repetitions based on contrast. The first is ve'ayati et oyevecha, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. The second is ve'sarti et sorerecha, and an adversary to your adversaries. In this, two very similar verbs are used. 
The first is sur, which is used for the first time in scripture. It comes from a primitive root, which means to cramp. From it, one gets the idea of binding up an enemy or afflicting them by besieging them. The second word is sarar. It carries the same meaning as sur, and it was first used in Exodus 12, verse 34, when it was said that the Israelites had their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now it is being used for the first time in the sense of one's enemies. Third, the words can't only be limited to the time before entering Canaan. We've already seen that heeding the voice of the Lord is used by the author of Hebrews to speak of our relationship with Christ. But he was quoting the 95th Psalm there in Hebrews. The psalmist spoke of today, just as the author of Hebrews did. Therefore, this is speaking of how God deals with his covenant people. Today, if you hear his voice. The promise began at Sinai, and it continues to be recalled to God's people since then. And finally, what is implied, but as yet is unstated, is that if they don't obey, there will be consequences. The opposite of what he promises here is explicitly noted in Leviticus chapter 26. There he says, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Before we go on, I should ask, after considering the words of this verse, do you think that the Lord works any differently today? Do you? It is to our benefit to follow the advice which is given here. Listening, you shall listen to his voice and do all that he speaks. We are under the new covenant and in the dispensation of grace, but we still have many commands and admonitions which have, have been given us by the Lord to heed. Verse 23, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. In verse 20, it said, I will send an angel. Now it says Malachi, or my angel. There is nothing here to preclude it being Christ. Rather, Malachi 3 verse 1 uses the same word, Malach, to first describe John the Baptist and then Christ Jesus. Here's what it says. Behold, I will send Malachi, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger, Malach, of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. It is Christ who will go before Israel, taking them into the land of promise. And the Lord promises to cut them off. In this, it means as collective people groups. Not all people are cut off. Some were eventually assimilated into Israel. One of David's leading military men was Uriah the Hittite, who was once the husband of Bathsheba. David was also noted as having bought the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite, who dwelt among them. Even in Jesus' time, a person is identified as being a woman of Canaan in the book of Matthew. Verse 24, you shall not bow down to their gods. Lo chave le Elohehem. As most of us already know, bowing down to a god is considered a way of honoring them and paying reverence to them. In so doing, it is an implicit act of trust that they can meet one's needs. It can also imply that one expects return benefits from them. This was utterly forbidden for them to do. This is something that is not only common in the Roman Catholic Church today, it is the standard daily ritual, particularly statues of Mary and the saints, as well as supposed relics of dead folk. Verse 24 continues, nor serve them, velo ta'abed them. To serve an idol is more than bowing down to them. It can be placing food before them, burning incense to them, singing to them, praying to them, or praising them. Again, this is SOP in the RCC. All of these are done daily at the Vatican and in most subordinate locations. Within the RCC, they attempt to make a distinction between what is offered to idols. They have three words, dulia, hyperdulia, and latria. Dulia is supposedly honor and recognition accorded to idols. Hyperdulia is lots and lots of dulia. This is accorded to Mary. Then there is latria, which is supposedly reserved for the worship of God. These distinctions are seen in word, not in practice. And they are exactly what comprise the closing words of John's first epistle. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Verse 24 continues, nor do according to their works. 
velo ta'ase ke ma'asehem. This is speaking of the cultic practices of those who followed these false gods. Some were sexual in nature. Some included human sacrifice or self-flagellation or other things. These were utterly forbidden. They were to keep from the idols and they were to keep from practicing the rites involved with those idols. In 1 Kings 11, Solomon is noted for having completely blown it in all three of these ways. Here's what it says. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, that means the Mount of Olives, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now, before I go on, I want to let you know that he married an Ammonitess, and she obviously pulled his heart away from the Lord, and yet that woman is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So God always turns good out of evil. You know, we hear the story, I want to remind you all the story of Lot. These two women went in and they slept with their father Lot in a cave. One had a son named Moab and one had a son named Ammon. And both of those go to Jesus, Moab and Ammon. So even in that account, which everybody slams, the women, if you watch that sermon, you'll know that they had the intent of their seed living through him, meaning the Messiah. They were looking forward to the Messiah. So don't always look at these sermons or these passages of the Old Testament and think that bad is intended when God gives you those stories. Look for Christ and you'll always find him there. Verse 24 continues, But you shall utterly overthrow them. Ki hares taharesem. In overthrowing, you shall overthrow them. This is speaking of the false gods. They were to be proven exactly that, false. Their altars were to be destroyed and their temples were to be torn down. There was to be nothing left of them. Even their foundations were to be destroyed. Verse 24 continues, and completely break down their sacred pillars. Veshaber teshaber matzevotechem. In breaking, you shall break their pillars. The false gods are identified with the images which represent them. They were to be utterly broken down. They were to be crushed, burned, and left as nothing more than refuse. It was the practice of conquering forces to take the idols of the vanquished nations and keep them as trophies of victory. However, this was not to be condoned in Israel. They were false. They couldn't save their own people, and they could only entice Israel to eventually look to them for what they could never provide. Unfortunately, King Amaziah failed in all respects concerning this 24th verse of Exodus 23. Here's what it says about him. Now it was so, after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them, and burned incense to them. How hopeless we are as a species. We reject what is good, and right, and honorable, and we give our allegiance to the passing wind. Verse 25, so you shall serve the Lord your God. In contrast to serving the false gods of Canaan, they are instructed to serve Jehovah Elohechem, or Jehovah your God. He alone is Israel's God, and he alone was to be served by them. In return for this, they could expect his divine favor. Verse 25 going on, and he will bless your bread and your water. This doesn't just mean that their food would be healthy, but that it would be abundant. They will not lack food or water when they are in a right relationship with the Lord. What is implicit here is that if they fail to serve him, bread and water would be lacking in both quantity and quality. Verse 25 continues, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Ellicott notes that half the sicknesses from which men suffer are directly caused by sin and would disappear if men led godly, righteous, and sober lives. Anybody doubt that? I mean, we cause our own problems by committing sin. You know, you sleep with a woman who's a prostitute and you get AIDS, that's caused by sin. So Ellicott is right in that. We have our own repercussions for sin in our lives. We drink too much, our liver goes bad, that's a result of our sin, right? But he goes on. He says, others as plague and pestilence are scourges sent by God to punish those who have offended him. Once again, he's correct in that. If they served the Lord, they would be blessed with health and vitality. 
This verse follows directly on the last use of the word translated as sickness, which is machale, which was used in Exodus 15, verse 26. It said there, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases, that word, on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Again, what is implied is that the opposite will certainly be true for a failure to adhere to the book of the covenant. Verse 26, no one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. This is probably speaking of both people and animals. When people are well fed and live in clean conditions, which the law will later give them instructions for, then those in the land would naturally not face these type of problems. This probably is not intended as anything more than a general pronouncement though. Godly women such as Hannah and Elizabeth were both barren for extended periods. However, the Lord eventually favored them both. Verse 26 continues, I will fulfill the number of your days. Again, when one follows the guidelines given in the law, they can expect to live long, normal lives. The Bible gives us guidelines for right and healthy living because it is written by the one who fashioned us. He knows what is right and what is best for us. By following his words and seeking after him, we will naturally be better off. When we depart from his way, of course we can expect early death through disease because of things like sexual sins or through trauma because of things like a bullet going through our noggin. Look at the world we live in today. The words of the Bible are normally borne out in how we conduct our lives. For the wicked, the Psalms give a very good general picture of life. Here's what it says. But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Well, we see that in Chicago every day of the week. Bloodthirsty men not living out half of their days, even a quarter of their days, because of the violence and the bloodthirst that they have. I will send my messenger before you. He will lead the way. He is the head of the army of the Lord. He is the king of my people, and to you I say... He will go before you always, he, my spoken word. Have no fear of your enemies, they are already defeated. I have sent my fear before you to break open a way. Even the enemy of death has been defeated. Over him my son prevailed at the dawning of the day. My name is in him, and so have no fear. It is your enemies to whom my fear has gone out. So in the exalted name of Jesus, send out a hearty cheer. Yes, in his name you shall give a resounding shout. Our second thought today is, I will send my fear before you, verses 27 through 33. Verse 27, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. These promises are conditional. The first two were literally fulfilled using the same word. The fear or emma certainly came to the people of Canaan prior to Israel's arrival. Rahab the harlot using the same word emma told this to the spies who visited her. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror, or Emma, of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. The confusion, or Hamam, was first seen in the Bible in Exodus 14 when the Lord confused the Egyptians as they pursued Israel through the Red Sea. In Joshua 10 verse 10, the same word is used again to describe the Lord confusing Joshua's enemies in battle. Verse 27 going on, and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. The opposite of the final promise is actually what is seen in scripture. In Joshua chapter 7, it is Israel not their enemies who turned their oref or their necks in battle. One of the congregation violated the law concerning the destruction of Jericho. Because of this in their next battle, they were routed. They turned their necks and they ran. The conditional nature of these promises is highlighted through the use of the selected words as they are later used in the book of Joshua. The Lord is asking us to look at them and to see how it is we who are either obedient to the Lord and flourish or who turn from him and falter. If so, we turn out to be our own worst enemies. Verse 28, And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. 
This verse introduces the Sarah or the hornet into the Bible. It is the first of just three times that they are mentioned. The word comes from the word Sarah, which means to be leprous. Also, there's an article in front of the word hornet. It is the hornet. The language here is to be taken metaphorically. First, similar terminology is used concerning bees in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 44 and in Psalm 118 verse 12. There, they are equated with one's enemies. Secondly, Joshua says that this was fulfilled in the case of the Amorites in Joshua 24, verse 12. I want to read it to you. I sent, past tense, the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also, the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. There it said that the hornet was what drove out the two kings of the Amorites. And yet Moses, speaking of the same battle, shows that it was, in fact, Israel who defeated them. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 3.8. And at that time we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were on this side of the Jordan from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon. This is repeated in Deuteronomy 4 verse 47 and it is referring to the kings Sihon and Og. What I speculate this is referring to is that there is a connection between the hornet and its associated word meaning leprosy. The Lord promised health and long life to Israel if they held to his laws. As they were going into a land defiled by those things which are opposed to a healthy lifestyle, the enemy had been afflicted with disease to the point where they were incapable of standing up to Israel's armies. Thus, the hornet is a metaphor for God's judgment of sickness upon them, preparing them for destruction by Israel. This is only speculation by Charlie Garrett, but the Bible bears out the record that Israel actually faced these foes in battle. Thus, it is to me a reasonable explanation for the term the hornet, which is said to have gone before them. Verse 29, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. There's a bit tied up in this verse. First, it is certainly that the inhabitants are to be driven out. However, there is an incremental process which is to take place. We look at the Lord's plans as if he is slacking, but this isn't the case. It's only from our short lifespans that we decide that things should move more quickly. Hence, every person in here says, I hope the rapture happens today, right? We do it all the time because we're looking at it from our short lifetime. I hope Jesus hurries up. The nation is devolving into paganism and I can't stand it anymore. But the Lord is looking at the long term. If all of the inhabitants were taken out at once, the land would become desolate. The word shamama or desolation is introduced into scripture here. The land was inhabited. There were fields, there were crops, there were fruit trees, there were wells, there were houses, etc. They were all over the place. If all of the people were taken out at once, there would have been an insufficient number of people to take them over. All of that productivity would have been lost. Further, these nations were collectively destroyed, but not all the individuals were. Some of them came into the people of Israel and actually led even to Christ himself. Rahab the harlot and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, are two that are known for sure. Further, it is later stated that some of the inhabitants were left in order to test Israel and to see if they would keep the way of the Lord or not. This is recorded in Judges chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. And finally, it was because of the beasts of the field becoming too numerous. This actually occurred after the exile of the ten tribes. In the book of two kings, we read this. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling, their mean, meaning people that had been brought in to replace the Israelites who had been driven out, that they did not know, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. It was noted after the Franco-German War that many districts in France had an explosion of wolves. These wouldn't just be physically harmful to the people, but they'd be devastating to the flocks and they would bring diseases with them as well. The Lord knew these things would occur, and so he determined to methodically take care of the occupation of Canaan. Verse 30, little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Me'at, me'at, agarashenu mepanecha. Little, little, I will drive them out from before your face. The idea here is the completed explanation from the previous verse. It implies that Israel will be fruitful and will multiply. They will increase in numbers, and as they do, they will be able to assume the responsibility for the land. It is, in picture, somewhat like Adam could have done in the Garden of Eden. 
If he was obedient, then he would have increased there. But in his disobedience, he was cast out to the east. In a similar way, Israel was given this wonderful land of promise, and they were told to increase there, being obedient to the Lord. Instead of this, they were eventually driven out and sent east to Babylon. The pattern repeated itself from abundance to want, from a land of delight to a land of captivity, and from the west to the east. Both Adam and Israel failed to keep the good things that they had been given. The Lord had done all of the work. All they needed to do was exercise faith, trust, and obedience, and both failed. Verse 31, Then I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea Philistia, and from the desert to the river. The boundaries of the land are defined here, and they cause those who deny predictive prophecy no end of stress. It wasn't until the time of Solomon that this prophecy was actually realized, and yet the Lord told them that this would be the land that they received. The Red Sea is the southern extremity. The Sea Philistia, or the Mediterranean, was to be their western border. The desert, meaning where they are now in Sinai, was to be the land border on the south, and the river, meaning the Euphrates, was to be their border to the north and the east. The term for the river, which is Hanahar, cannot be taken as meaning the Jordan. It is later explicitly described as the Euphrates twice in Deuteronomy and once in Joshua. This immense expanse of land is what was promised to Israel after it having first been promised to their forefather Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 18. Verse 31 going on, For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out from before you. This verse here clearly explains the previous conundrum concerning the term the hornet. The Lord says that he will deliver the inhabitants of the land into the hands of Israel. When he does, they are to respond by driving the people out. Thus, the term the hornet must be taken metaphorically. The Lord prepared the people for being driven out, and Israel accomplished the matter. Verse 32, you shall make no covenant with them. Interestingly, the book of the covenant, which begins in Exodus 20, verse 22, began with a warning against idolatry. It now closes with the same theme. It is an exceptional warning to the people that they were to take heed and not participate in any idolatrous worship. They were admonished to keep far, far from it. In these words, the people are warned to not cut any covenant with the people. This was violated almost immediately after they entered the land of promise. Joshua failed to check with the Lord concerning a covenant with the Gibeonites, and he, in fact, made a covenant with them. This wasn't the only such infraction either. In Judges 2, verses 2 and 3, we read this, And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. What is important to understand is that such a covenant was normally not only with the people. There was more to it than a simple treaty. Verse 32 continues, nor with their gods. In making a covenant with a people group, it was the custom to acknowledge the God or gods of that people group. Sometimes it was implicit, at other times it was explicit. Sacrifices would be made and then an acknowledgement of the God's ability to protect and keep secure the covenant was involved. Thus, by cutting such a covenant, it was acknowledging the belief system of the other group. This is unfortunately now what has happened between many, many Christian sects and Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. Remember that video from the Pope that I published just a couple weeks ago and I told you about in the prophecy update where he said that all paths lead to God. You can go anyway and you can get up to this great God. This is exactly what's going on. There is either an implicit or an explicit acknowledgement of the power of the false gods or of their incorrect faith in the true God of these other religions. This shows the epitome of contempt for the one true God when it occurs. Like Israel of old, many will face the same sad end because of their failure to hold to the Lord alone. Verse 33, they shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. Allowing pagans to remain in the land will inevitably result in turning from the Lord. This is seen time and time again in the Bible. If a person became a part of the covenant people, they were to give up on their religion and turn to the Lord. 
Ruth, for example, was one famous for having clung to the Lord God of Israel. But for those who didn't cling to him, only trouble could result. This is the story of America today. Little by little, false religions have crept in and the collective heart of the people has turned away from him. There is no longer a fear of the Lord and the land is devolved into utter wickedness because of it. This was the final warning to Israel. Like them, we failed to take heed. Verse 33 finishes with these words, for if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Making alliances with those who worship other gods will inevitably result in the weakening of the true faith. It is as a snare by which one is caught. This is the first time that the word mokesh or snare is used in this way concerning the true faith. It is as if one is walking along and without even seeing it lying there, they step in it and are set on a path to destruction. This is the end for all who mingle the true faith with that which is false. Unfortunately, Israel failed to heed, and unfortunately, we have failed to heed as well. The gospel has gone out. It has been well received by the world, and now it is on a path of apostasy from which it will probably not recover. The Lord will take action, and he will destroy Mystery Babylon from the face of the earth. All who are a part of her are unfortunately going to be destroyed with her. But before that day comes, there is still a chance to get right with the Lord. There is time to call on Christ and to be saved from the inevitable. You see, the book is written and the judgments are already laid out, as Bob showed us once again today. It's all been written in the past. All we can do is endure until he calls us home to be with him. After that occurs, the world will be cast into a time of global destruction. It is all because we have failed to simply receive the word and to stand fast on it. Today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Call on Jesus and be reconciled to God through him. Let me tell you how you can, even right now. Once again, week after week, I have to keep saying the same things. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. The law is given and the law is simply given to show us how utterly sinful sin is. God knew that they would fail in this. Just as Adam was cast out of Eden, Israel was cast out of their land twice because they couldn't obey the law of God. And so God did something for us that we can't do. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the true Israel. He never sinned. He was never cast out of God's presence in the sense that he was exiled. He paid the sin debt for us. He died and he rose again to prove that he had prevailed where these people had failed. And now, instead of wrath and condemnation, he offers us mercy and grace and restoration. All we have to do, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. This is what God would ask of you. And this book of the covenant is not to be taken lightly. Yes, it's Old Testament. Yes, the law is set aside. It's annulled. It's obsolete in Christ. But the lessons in the law, that of obedience to God, will never change. He's given us the New Testament. He says, have faith. And then after that, he says, and after your faith, then start doing these things. Because if you do, it will go well with you and with your children. This is what God would expect of us. Please, please understand this. And if you have never received Jesus Christ and simply said, I know that I need Jesus, well, then call on him. Just call on him and be reconciled to God through him. And if you don't, I feel so bad for you because every person in here Every person here right now has been in here at least 20 sermons, maybe more. Well, except you guys, maybe five. But they're visitors, so they don't count. But what I'm saying is if you have sat here all of this time, imagine the guilt that you stand before God for saying, I sat and listened to this gospel presentation 20 or 30 or 100 times, and I failed to call on Jesus. I was told, right? There are people in the world that weren't told. Those who don't know and don't do it, you know, they'll receive little punishment, but those who know to do good and don't do it will receive many stripes. I know I misquoted that, but you get the picture. Call on Jesus. It's the most simple thing in the world. But if you don't do it, you will forever be separated from God. Our closing verse, I already read it once. I very rarely do this, but I'm going to do it this time. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That's 1 John 5, 21. I very rarely quote anything twice in a sermon, but that's so important. That is New Testament, and that is telling us to keep away from idols because they will be a snare to you. Next week is Exodus 24, 1 through 8. 
Israel agreed to the word he sent. It's entitled, This is the Blood of the Covenant. That'll be your 65th Exodus sermon. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters and he can lead you through it on dry ground. So follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? Poem. Poem today, it's a little long because we had a lot of verses, but it's called Covenant Promises and Expectations. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. It is waiting for you there today. Beware of him and obey his voice. Him do not provoke, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Do as I spoke. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, you my word with you do carry, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and to your adversaries an adversary. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites too, and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. This I will do. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to the works they make, but you shall utterly overthrow them and their sacred pillars down you shall completely break. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water too, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Pay heed to this word. Please understand. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion. It is true. Among all the people to whom you come, and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which, I shall dri which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you too. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest becomes desolate the land. Then the beasts of the field that cause fear become too numerous for you, lest they get out of hand. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land, and any terror for that from them will have ceased. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to Philistia's sea, and from the desert to the river, all this your territory shall be. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out from before you. This I proclaim for you to understand. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. I tell you now plainly, they shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And so I admonish you now, this thing you shall not do. Help us to follow in, help us, Lord, to follow in your way. Help us to live rightly according to your word. Let our lives be dedicated to you, renewed each day. And let our deeds be for the sake of our Lord. Great are you, O God, and worthy of our praise. Your word is perfect and your ways are just and true. And so we shall follow you with obedient hearts always until the ages of ages we will praise and glorify you. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for that, uh, getting me through that sermon. There are a lot of tongue twisters in there and uh, I just, uh, I, I really, really appreciate you getting me through to the end of it. Lord, I uh, have a special prayer today for, uh, I don't remember, let me check this person's name right now, uh, Jack Warner who's having open heart surgery tomorrow, we would pray that that would go well and that uh, when he gets out, he would find a good church to attend. He is a Christian, but needs to find a fellowship. And I also pray for Ann Brandon, who's having her hip replaced starting tomorrow, that you would be with her and with the doctors as they work on her and bring her back to a state of wholeness and completion and have her doing jumping jacks very soon. And uh, Lord, we thank you for these words in this sermon. They are most marvelous because they remind us that we have not only covenant promises, but we have covenant expectations. And how many times do we as Christians fail to remember the expectations? We claim the promises, we snap our fingers and we demand Porsches and, and all kinds of good stuff, health and, and welfare and, and all of those things, but we fail to say, I'm going to be obedient to your word. Oh Lord, forgive our hearts for that kind of iniquity and help us to first be obedient to your word and then look for those many blessings that you lavish down upon us. You sure are a great God. You are wonderful in all of your ways. Just marvelous. We thank you above all for the gift of your son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, and what he did that we couldn't do, and then the life he gave up on the cross for us. How wonderful you are. Thank you for that gift. We love you, we praise you, and we exalt you in his name. Amen. Amen.
we get the uh, instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And there we read these words from Paul's hand. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, which would have been these words, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem, Min HaAretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, First a blessing, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Uh, before I say a prayer to close us, I've already said it, but please remember, if you were leaving without eating something, take something, okay? Because I know that we have too much, and uh, just save me one uh, cinnamon bagel, and I'll be a happy camper. Other than that, please just eat. If there's anything left, please take it, and... Um, uh, uh, Next week is, uh, I probably shouldn't say this and embarrass her, but it's my wife's birthday next week. I just want to let you know that. And uh, so, I, yeah, she, she, she gets embarrassed about those things, but I'm so happy that my wife of 31 years, who's going to be 17 years old. So oh. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, it's the real deal. Every, you know, I have to, I to save a lot of money the other three years. <laughs> I don't have to buy her a present. But. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah. born. Oh, I, the people may be listening. Yeah, she's born on a leap year, and so uh, 
So uh, I, I, I uh, only get her a present once every four years. I'm kidding, of course, but anyway, I thank the Lord for this beautiful woman who's been my wife these many years. As, and, you know, somebody said yesterday in an email, you really seem like you got the right one. And I said, you guys can't even know. <laughs> Boy, anybody else would have killed me 31 years ago. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing of fellowship of this small congregation, which is so wonderful. And for anybody that's online with us, sharing in our good times, it is so wonderful to be in your presence. We love you. We love the fellowship. We love the honor of sharing in the Lord's table, remembering his sacrifice until he returns again for us. And may that day be so. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.